Thank you so much. You know, even though it's the last minute thing, I just told them like three, four days ago and they were like right on and uh, they, thank you for putting up with all the technical difficulties and staying with us since 11 o'clock and you know, like hugs guys. Thank you. <laughs> just like to make a song and dance a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll uh, move on. Uh, welcome to the panel on uh, universal values. Um, so I welcome you all. Megan, can you wait for a minute? Yeah, look, you can wait for a So I welcome you all to the uh, panel on universal values. Uh, we have uh, Kathleen Kelly from uh, Rational Society. And uh, we have Kate Lovelady. She's the lead uh, of Ethical Society. And we have Dynamic James Crop. Uh, outreach Director of um, Ethical Society and uh, also I would next request Babu Garu to join the panel. So I will hand over the run to Kathleen. Thanks again. Uh, as you said, I'm the President of the uh, Saint Rational Society of St. Louis and we have uh, Kate Lovely with our uh, Ethical Society who was educated at Northwestern and has been the, uh, the leader at the Ethical Society since 2005. And James Croft, your uh, head of uh, outreach, I think, right? Yes. And Babu is just very well known internationally. <laughs> he knows Babu. Okay. So um, I wanted to start with a short, uh, short statement uh, that I wrote about the importance of universal values. And, um, there really isn't a universally accepted moral code, but there are many approximations of one, and I think there might be a universally accepted moral code someday. An example of a fairly successful attempt at a listing of universal values was the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, created in 1948. It was an ambitious attempt and specified such rights as freedom of speech and assembly, and equal pay for equal work to education and fair trials, among other things. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights set a very high bar, which most countries on the planet still don't meet, but we're working on it. So, uh, people follow many different paths to get to their conclusions about what they believe is right and wrong. Uh, some people follow a path of Hinduism, some people follow a path of Christianity, Islam, atheism, Buddhism, or any number of other belief systems. But humans often get to somewhat similar conclusions. Most people believe honesty, kindness, and responsibility are right, while murder, stealing, and lying are wrong. We start out from different points, but we end up agreeing on important issues, even while there is plenty of disagreement about details. This matter of deciding what is moral and what is not is of critical importance because we only have civilization insofar as we have moral behavior. In other words, morality equals civilization. If a person doesn't believe they'll be treated fairly by others, they'll be unlikely to trade with others and without trade, community withers. Civilization enables many things that provide us with quality of life. Healthcare, infrastructure, order and security, a steady, steady food supply, and safe drinking water. Uh, whether a person believes in God or not, adhering to a rigorous, rational moral code and making sure that others do so also is absolutely critical to providing the benefits of civilization. A robust civilization is the difference between life and death for millions of people. We all need to care deeply about morality because morality equals civilization. So, uh, I think I will, without further ado, turn uh, the speaker over the microphone over to Kate Lovely. Thank you. Hello to those in the room, and hello to those watching this virtually or watching in the future. Um, my name is Kate Lovelady. I am leader of the Ethical Society of St. Louis. Ethical societies are institutions that have existed for over 130 years. Um, both in America and abroad, but not that many people know that much about them. So I'd like to share a little bit today about how and why ethical societies were created as it relates to our topic more generally about humanism. In the late 19th century, people in many countries were rethinking religion in the light of new or newly 
widespread information. This was a uh, range from Darwin's explanation of evolution by natural selection, the fact that was evident, I think, to most people that despite these thousands of years of religions, there were still many problems and oppressions in the world and exploitation, and the simple fact that there are so many religions around the world and that they seem to have, on the one hand, basic similarities of the type that Kathleen mentioned, yet completely different ideas about supernatural questions, such as the nature of gods or the afterlife or the existence of these things. So the question that ethical societies sought to answer is the same question that secular democracies are still trying to answer today. What are the fundamental ethical principles that all people can agree on? or that most people can agree on. What sources can we use to ground moral arguments today such that everyone can take part in them equally or has the uh, opportunity to take part in them equally? Because in the past, when moral arguments were based on religious traditions, they're usually based on some form of authority. Um, scriptures, revelations, basically morals were founded on people who were considered special, kind of saying what was right. This is right, this is wrong, this is true, this is false, and I know this because God told me, or I had a revelation, or there's a special book and I know how to read it correctly, or different ways. The problem with that, of course, is A, you never know if that person is really right or not, and then there are lots of other people who have equally sounding sometimes ideas saying, well, no, God told me this, or my scripture says that, or I have a different interpretation of the same scripture. And so as people looked around and moved around continents and around the globe, they quickly discovered that there's this huge diversity in the world and thousands of religious traditions. Um, growing up in America, I thought that maybe there were three, and apparently there are thousands, and each one claims to be right, and people are often too willing to fight and even kill and die to protect their claim that their religion or their interpretation or their tradition is the right one. And so this is an age-old problem. It's a problem we still have today, especially if we value democracy and diversity. We have all these people coming with different traditions and backgrounds and beliefs trying to come together. So then the obvious problem we have in a diverse democracy is that when people try to argue questions of morals based fully or mostly on their traditional backgrounds or religions, there's no way to determine who is right. There's no objective ground to have a conversation about morality. It's just I believe this, I believe that, my scripture says this, or my scripture says that, and that A, is not a very effective way to debate, and B, it's a good way to end up with violence because there's no way to find common ground with that kind of discussion. So at the Ethical Society, we promote a secular approach to morality because we judge that to be the most democratic and universal way of making decisions. And a secular approach to ethics says, you can believe anything you want, but you have to make your moral argument on something that is relatively objective, on things that most people have access to, such as scientific evidence, common human experience, logic, and reason. This is also called a humanist approach because it looks at things that all humans can understand and agree on, at least theoretically. So using that humanist approach to ethics and morality, for instance, we can begin to make progress on some age-old questions such as the rights of women. There are many traditions and religions from all over the world that make all kinds of claims about women, how women should, what they should be allowed to do, what is right um, for women to do, how a good woman acts, and things like that. And these, these claims, these beliefs, usually go back to someone, usually a man, claiming that God or a scripture or a vision told him that this is what women should do, this is what women should be like. And then, of course, there are other people who claim that God or a scripture or a vision told them something else that women should do or be like. Uh, as Kathleen said, and I do believe that all people have some basic similar values, 
based on the fact that we're all one species. We all evolved in the same way. We evolved as social animals. So in this example of women's rights, all these different traditions, they probably have some similar basic values. They may all say, if you ask them, for instance, that they care about women, that they care about families, that they want to keep women safe. And yet all these traditions have created radically different moral rules when it comes to women. So even though there are universal values, it doesn't necessarily help us if we are basing our arguments on unarguable religious traditions instead. The humanist approach rather looks at the kinds of arguments that have no answer to them except my God said this, my God said that, and said we need to set those aside. You can believe whatever you want, but if we are going to come to decisions together, for instance, when it comes to questions of women's rights, we need to look at things that are here in this world and that we can all have access to, such as speaking to as many women as possible and asking them, asking us as a woman, what do we think? What is your experience like? We can interview large and diverse numbers of women. We can look at how real women and real men act in the real world. We can investigate that. We can compare places with different kinds of rules and see how they do. We can look at research that shows us what actually helps a person to be happy and productive. That's something that we can research. We don't have to just guess about that. Some people believe, for instance, that, um, or they used to believe, at least in America, and some of them maybe still do, that if women are, are educated, that that will be bad for them. They might not even be able to bear children. This was a, a supernatural belief, a superstitious belief. And there's plenty of evidence that that is not true. So, so in the ethical society, we use a humanist approach to moral questions in the hopes that together we can arrive at solutions that all people can see the evidence for and accept and hopefully agree on eventually. So as humanists, we are optimistic about the long-term view of humanity, at least, that we can make progress together by using this secular humanist approach to looking at problems in the world, and that's what we do at the Ethical Society. You're still optimistic? I'm still optimistic. <laughs> well, that's good. You keep hold of that optimism, despite everything that's happening in the world. So Kate's talked a little bit about the philosophy on which the Ethical Society is based. And as she said, the Ethical Society and all Ethical Societies are committed to certain values which we hold to be universal, in the sense that they are values that everybody should be able to affirm regardless of their beliefs about God or the supernatural. And central to those values, in my idea at least, of ethical humanism, which is the tradition that ethical societies exist to represent and promote, is the idea of the equal dignity of all people. And there's a quote from our founder which I think expresses that really well. He said, the conception of worth that each person is an end per se, is not a mere abstraction. Our interest in it is not merely academic. Every outcry against the oppression of some people by other people, or against what is morally hideous, is the affirmation of the principle that a human being as such is not to be violated. A human being is not to be handled as a tool, but is to be respected and revered. That was Felix Adler the founder of the first ethical society, speaking more than a hundred years ago now, and it's that same value that we seek to promote today in the Ethical Society of St. Louis and at the ethical societies around the country. And we are committed not just to talking about that value, but to helping people live their lives in accordance with it. And so we encourage our members and people who come to our programs to get involved in all sorts of social action in order to shape society so that it more closely reflects that value. So if we look around the United States society today and globally, we'll find that there are many groups of people who are discriminated against, both by law and by culture or by religion or other traditions. And we encourage people to fight against that. So concretely at our ethical society right now, we have members 
who are engaged in the fight against homophobia and transphobia here in the United States, members involved in the fight for women's rights, particularly reproductive rights, and recently, because of what's been happening in St. Louis over the past few years, members engaged heavily in the movement for black lives, fighting against particularly police violence against African Americans and people in color, people of color in general. And very often, members of our community are fighting for the rights of minority groups of which they are not a member themselves. And this is because we believe in a basic universal standard of treatment that every human being deserves. And because we understand that we live in a community together, and we live in a country together, and we live on a planet together, and therefore we are ultimately connected to each other and responsible for each other. And so people who are members of ethical societies believe that we have real ethical responsibilities to every other person on the planet, and that those responsibilities should inform how we live our own lives. And so, speaking personally, when I see African Americans being shot by police at a higher rate than white people like me, we believe it's our responsibility to do something about it, even though I'm not an African American myself. And I hope that when some law comes out that targets me as a gay man, whether you are gay or not, you are going to do something about it, because we um, are connected to each other. And that is the heart of the humanist belief, the willingness to fight on behalf of every other human person, because we believe that we are all equal, we are all connected, and we have to work together to improve the world for all of us. Now sometimes that does mean our commitment to universal values is going to mean that we say that something that some individual is doing, or some organization is doing, or culture or religion is doing, is wrong. We sometimes have to make a moral judgment about what other people or other organizations or other cultures are doing. And sometimes I understand people get uncomfortable about that. We feel judgmental. We don't want to say, what you're doing is wrong and you should stop it. We feel like we should respect other cultures simply because they're different from our own. And I think that we should actually think of it a little differently to that, that this is no different than telling a family member or a friend that we think that some of their behavior is bad behavior because it's hurting someone. Get one step further and apply that same principle to a broader scale and say, there are people are watching, don't worry about How many hearts did I get? Yeah. Everyone hit that heart button on Facebook yeah. Live yeah. right now. Yeah. I want to see it. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I do not have too much new stuff to add to what I have said and been saying through the day. Um, but if you're talking universal values, one of the questions we have to answer people is those who do not belong to our culture of universal values and explain to them why ours or what we are advocating for is not simply an elevated particularism. Because how can it not be that Islam has values which are universal? Because you, Islam wants those rules for all of humanity. And so will other religions too, given the chance, get everyone to accept their values. Um, so a constant challenge for us is to show that we don't mean to be imposing Western values on the whole world, but that we are imposing um, no values on anyone, but we are inviting people to participate in the universal values that we have conceived of. I think history will help us in this matter because the most recent expression, most articulate expression of universal values in the last few hundred years has been from the global West. But that was not the first time that this has happened. The very first enlightenment of human history is not that of Europe and France and that happened in the region of the world, which is today India, Bangladesh, and Nepal, with the arrival of the Buddha. Because the first enlightenment, the first humanist movement, so to say, would be traced to this person who suggested that we have no reason to waste our time 
speculating about the existence of a God because we will not come to any conclusion. And who, in a godless world, proposed a morality which was universal. There is always be good and be nice and tell the truth and so on, uh, which has been the main morality of the Buddha. And in a society already uh, divided uh, in terms of caste, the one would recognize that that caste system was slightly flexible compared to the one of today. Um, he opened the doors of his community to women and to all people of all castes without applying the test of religion and caste, First Amendment. Um, and that already, I believe, is the first time universal values were being offered uh, at such scale. Individuals may have conceived of it, but here was this man traveling, I think, 40 times on foot, a distance of 75 kilometers, about 50 miles or a bit less, preaching and meeting people and inviting them to him. So I would say the answer to why is this not an elevated particularism is because it applies to all through choice, not by imposition. And it has been a human tradition discovered even before it was so well articulated in the West, already somewhere else, in a different language, with a different idiom. So we can trace these yearnings for freedom and human equality and the application of reason in the conduct of human affairs. And that is a universal achievement and not belonging to a particular culture. If we do not interfere with the growth of a child, the moral development of a child, we will find this. It's often said that the first novel has been written in Europe, but 600 years before the first European novel formally identified was written uh, by Ibn Tufel um, from um, Castilian Spain, but he was there because the Arabs had already occupied Europe, that part of Europe. And he wrote this philosophical novel, which is extraordinary as a thought experiment. A baby is abandoned by the mother in the sea, in a casket, almost like Moses' story, or that of uh, Karna in the Mahabharata. Because she did not want to let anyone know that she had a baby outside of um, a wedlock. And the baby drifts along with the waters and it ends up on an island. Um, the island is uninhabited by humans. A deer raises the child and the deer raises the child. Eventually the deer dies and the child is curious, including the dead body of the mother which raised it and is investigating. And the child comes to certain conclusions. And Ibn Tufel, in his obviously fictitious, fictitious novel, proposes that if a child is left alone to grow by itself, with the right care that the deer provided, the child would be rational. The conclusion of that novel is uh, al Hatim, the, the name of the novel, uh, is that in nature, the human would become simply rational. Now, while it's a novel, it's an idea developed in a part outside the Western world and before its first articulation in the West. So these, I would say, are the proposals for the universal applicability of our values because their origins are in all civilizations. As far as the moral values and framework that we can have uh, for the modern world. There is nothing, and I said this in the previous session, there is nothing can match the moral compulsion and attractiveness of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Nowhere in humanity's civilized history in the last 2,500 years has anyone in two simple pages 
articulated the greatest ideals of human society in just simply two pages in 30 different statements. Affirming the equality of the human, confirming the dignity of the human existence, of the fact that we all have a conscience, that we all have access to rights, and that we have all equal access to those rights, of protection from the state, opportunity to educate ourselves, not simply education, but in critical education, access to the latest and the most modern care that society would offer, and um, understanding that everyone in society is able to participate in it. Where have we seen that? In which book, where, when, how? Even the humanist manifestos are 20, 30 pages long. This is just two pages, just two pages. And it summarizes having distilled the great achievements of different civilizations in there. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a product not of one group of countries. Every independent country in the 1940s had an opportunity to participate in its formulation. Of course, Saudi Arabia and Soviet Union and the bloc of Soviet Union countries were very unhappy and did not cooperate completely in its formulation. There was a Christian and a Hindu and a Buddhist and um, um, a Muslim, in a person of Muslim origin uh, in that formulation. And since then till now, countries had the opportunity to ask for it to be changed or modified because new countries have become independent, they became members of the UN, um, though they made a few little uh, powerless but very noisy statements, they managed to change nothing. That means they're all still part of that Universal Declaration. Nobody went and unsigned that Universal Declaration. On the other hand, the Islamic groups uh, of countries have issued a universal declaration of Islamic values. If it's Islamic, how is it universal? If it's universe, how is it universal? How is it Islamic? Is something for them to answer, not for me to bother about. But the fact is, proselytizing religions will always offer something that they want everyone to adopt. Um, in the discussion of universal values, I think we will need to look at these areas of resistance that we will encounter. As different groups of people become more articulate, different ideas are offered, and one dangerous idea that the Islamic countries and the African countries offer is the rights of the community. That communities have rights that can override the rights of individuals. The fundamental understanding, both of basic morality and of jurisprudence, is that rights reside in individuals, that it's individuals who are the holders of rights. Once these rights, the locus of rights, is expanded to the community, then we do great damage to the worth and value of the individual. Um, this is a danger that was very clear and present about 10 years ago, but it is coming back. And with an inadequate leadership in the United Nations, with no direction at all from the United States of America, and if there is one direction that is misdirection today in the international world, these are again back in question. So the origins, the foundations, and the justification for universal values has now been questioned again. And I fear that, uh, for example, in the United States, the idea of the clash of civilizations has spread viral. Uh, that civilization is a fixed entity, that it will not change, alter, adapt, and give of itself is in itself a damaging idea of civilization. It ignores or denies the character of culture that it is dynamic. Um, 
So this idea, this most influential article um, in foreign affairs, um, the clash of civilizations, which has influenced American policy, is damaging. The lens through which international politics is looked at today is a clash of civilizations, Islamic versus the Christian, the Hindu, the Chinese, the African. The African is mixed. Um, unless we are able to formulate an appropriate response to foreign policies too being influenced by this very narrow idea of what culture is. That culture is geographic, that culture is unchanging, that culture is permanent, um, creates serious problems for the globalizing world because it will then end up being simply a globalizing market, which is the power and the motor of today's globalization. The moment the universal vision is gone, we will end up with a new imperialism of the kind of the civilizing influence of the West, which has only left the world in tatters through colonialism. I wanted to add these aspects to the analysis you are bringing to the questions of universal life. Things to add. Okay. Did it? Did anybody have any questions? Hardly. Why don't you give some more tough things? Well, I'm, I'm actually an outlier. So, uh, but this was supposed to be a Q and A time, and uh, oh, if anybody spoke also, also there. Yes. Oh, okay. Do we have any access to the previous sessions? Have Facebook questions? Yes. Are there any now? Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. No. No, we, I don't have any now. No, not so far. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I think we can continue this conversation between each other. I mean, I, I appreciate very much what you're saying, and my, my guess is that our answer would be that putting forth um, the rights of the individual is how we can counter a lot of these claims to um, culture or other things. Um, because not even any culture includes everyone in it being happy about that. And so, particularly when it comes to the rights of, of women, there are often claims about where our, our culture believes this about women. Whereas if you talk to the actual people and individuals and individual women within the culture, you will hear a lot of variations and a lot of different opinions about that. So by holding up the rights of the individual at all times, I think that that in some ways gets us around some of these discussions or these, these claims about clashes of civilizations or clashes about group values and, if, and how our universal values are, can be applied universally is because we're starting from the place of the individual and each individual, whatever their context or whatever their culture having these rights that cannot be or should not be taken away um, and that those trump all rights of culture but as you say that in itself is an argument that some people would not accept because they are arguing for the community except the community doesn't really exist because the community is always made up of a lot of individual people who usually have a lot of different ideas within it. So when people talk about the community, usually what they're talking about is some kind of authoritarian vision or some kind of um, of the community because we are talking about every single individual within the community. So our individual rights, in, we could argue, are even more communitarian in a sense that we are taking into account the, the concerns and the the affirming the human worth of every person in that community and not trying to make a claim about the community that is really just usually the desires of those who are trying to lead or control the community. So I'm going to make up my own question here. Um, I think that it's a good idea to focus on the benefits of universal values. Now we've all kind of talked about that a little bit. 
but um, the there's a tremendous amount of push to uh, promote values that are not universal values. And I would like for us, you know, folks on the panel to talk about what are the benefits, what do we get if we can work together across different belief systems? What do we get? What's the benefit? Why, why, does, why do universal values benefit people? Think about it first. Well, I'll, I'll talk for a couple minutes and then you can think about it. Because I'll just say that I think it's connected to my opening remarks, which is that for me, a lot of humanism is not even so much universal values as, as a, a universal process of coming to ethical decisions. And the benefit of that is everyone has an equal opportunity to take part in it because it is based on things that are equally available to every human being such as common human experience, such as um, reason, such as logic. These, these are things that anyone can learn, anyone can have access to, and that gives every, everyone an equal opportunity to take part in that discussion, and to take part in that decision, whereas non-universal values that are based on on tradition, as I said, are usually based on some kind of authority. And that is not something that people can have any access to unless you're a part of the authority or fight to try to become an authority. <laughs> but, um, so that's what I would say is one of the biggest benefits of, you know, of a universal process of values such as humanism is that it's accessible to everyone and it is the, the best opportunity for people to find common ground because they can actually understand each other rather than simply making absolutist inarguable statements on either side of things. I think that's a very good way of putting it because I actually don't think, at least in my mind, that the goal of humanists right now is or should be to get everybody to live by a shared set of values. I think that's extremely unlikely to occur, and I think that that is not necessarily even desirable. I think that what we want is something at a slightly different level, which is that not that everybody lives by a shared set of values, but that we establish a social, political, and cultural framework which enables every individual to decide what values they wish to live by themselves and refrain from imposing those values on other people. That, to me, would be a state consistent with humanism. It's a difference between saying, so I am not Jewish, I eat pork, and many of my Jewish friends do not eat pork because of a value set informed by their religion that I don't share. Now, they could demand that everybody in the world live by their values and also not eat pork, and I wouldn't support living in that situation. But I'm perfectly happy for them to refrain from eating pork if they want to refrain, right? That is not, I'm not going to tell them that they have to eat it. So I don't need them to share my values. What I need them to do, and this is true of most Jewish people, is not to expect me to live by the values they have chosen, and also to not expect the um, institutions of the state, like uh, the government or state education systems, to try and teach their values to children. So when people say, so Babu basically asked the question, well, how can we convince people that encouraging humanism is not just sort of imposing a, uh, a Western value set on the rest of the world, just like some religious fundamentalists would like to impose their value set on the rest of the world? Well, the way I respond to that is by saying, well, actually what we're wanting to do, as Kate was just saying, is establish a framework which enables everybody to live by values that they personally choose, as long as it doesn't infringe upon basic rights of other people. And there is a difference between that framework and requiring everyone to live by a concrete set of values. It's the difference between saying, you all have to live according to the same values as me, and you should have the opportunity to live by the values that you choose to live by, and I should have the same opportunity. Now that entails certain political arrangements that have to happen to 
uh, ensure that is the case. So, for instance, a secular government is such a big problem. We can't have a government controlled by a particular religion and have a space where everybody is free to choose the religious life that they want. But it also means that we don't want an aggressively atheist government. We don't want a government shutting down churches like existing in some communist countries that's telling people they cannot be religious. That isn't the goal. And I think it's very important to keep in mind the distinction between creating a framework which enables people to decide how they wish to live for themselves, which is what I think we want, and enforcing a certain set of values on everybody because we think they're universal. It gets a bit complicated. Yes. James and I like to argue. So, and I'm not arguing, <laughs> but I just want to clarify one thing that often gets lost in this kind of discussion is that it's not so much, you know, a another group cannot, it, it is wrong for them to impose their values on me, but it is also wrong for them to impose their values on each other. Yes, right. Because, and this often happens particularly um, it, that again we come down to the individual and not the community or the family or the organization or the institution but every individual having their own right and I know that you believe this um, it just sometimes it, it can get lost particularly because someone may say well you know this is this is my value to run my family this way, and it's none of your business. And it may not be any of my business how an individual runs themselves, but when they are affecting other human beings, even if they are related to those other human beings, then I think that that does bring up questions of, of human rights, and that those belong to every single individual. So I just want to clarify. I want to give a concrete example of this because I wrote about this at length in my doctoral dissertation. This is the first time I've ever spoken about my doctoral dissertation in a public forum, so this is very exciting for me. But uh, there is a group of, uh, there's a culture in the United States, the Amish culture, which are people who live in certain parts of the country and decide not to use certain technology. And they also have ways of educating their children, which they wanted to keep so that they could raise their children within their quite closed communities. And there was a big legal fight in the United States a few decades ago as to whether they should be allowed to raise their children in their own communities without their children being sent to public schools at all. And some people were saying, well, we should respect their culture and how they wish to live, and therefore they should be able to raise their children as they like. And other people were saying, those children have a right to decide whether they wish to continue to be members of that community, and that right is not being respected if they are removed from public schools. And eventually a compromise was reached by which Amish children had to go to public schools until a certain age, and then uh, they could go, in, they could not go at all, and the age was younger than it is for other kids in America. And I argued in my doctoral dissertation, uh, among many other things, that this was wrong, that in fact we were depriving those children of their right to determine their own future, and that if they, at the age of majority, when they are adults, have gone through the full educational system and taken advantage of everything that it provides them, choose to live within an Amish community, so then that's an opportunity to leave it when they want to. But for parents, they're chatting with their children from birth and say, because you